it's not so bad today. It's since we're out here early. This uh, this counts as as not hot, I think. Reef Bay is is the only fully undeveloped watershed that we are able to study. And what makes Reef Bay so special is it's right next door to Fish Bay, which is developed. And so because they're next to each other, they get the same kind of weather. Like when it rains, it generally rains around the same amount over both of them. And so that means we can directly compare the stream flow at both guts. You know, it doesn't look like there was much flow here in the Reef Bay gut because um, if you look, you don't see too many of the telltale signs. You usually look for like uh, a bunch of leaves and branches like wrapped around a tree limb or something a few feet off the ground. And I don't see anything like that. So we go to a lot of effort in our work on the watershed team to figure out where water is and what water is doing. It's become clear to me just how important it is for us in the Virgin Islands to understand water as a resource, and it's a limited resource. The fact is, we don't have a very good idea right now of how much water we have in the Virgin Islands, and that is critical because we can't just pipe it from Puerto Rico or for the, from the mainland. David Hensley's research for us is really exciting and unique because he's the first person to be putting instruments in our terrestrial and watershed environments in order to understand the water that's moving across the islands that isn't yet in our marine and coastal environment. So we use several different devices and sensors that really form what I like to call a monitoring network to actually help us understand the watershed all the time. Probably the most important, I might say, is the water level sensor. It's a very small thing about that large and it sits at the bottom of the gut. And we put it there intentionally so that when water does start to collect, it can notice that immediately. It basically knows whether it's under an inch of water, a foot of water, 10 feet of water. So it's a record of what happened in the gut, and that's huge. But we want to know more than that. Uh, we want to know why does the water collect when it does, how long is it in the gut, and where else does it go? Because not all the water goes in the gut. A lot of it goes into the ground, and then what happens to it there? Okay, no wasps. <laughs> okay. It's definitely Jack Spaniels around here too, so. So the key is to get an undisturbed sample, meaning I just want to drive this in and then everything that it's surrounding, surrounding here will be kept as it is on the surface. And there you can see there's that undisturbed cylinder that we pulled out of the ground. And so we unscrew it to remove the sample. And then there's your undisturbed soil sample. And we really want to know from this what the compaction of the soil is and that's important for understanding the ridge to reef flow processes because not all soils are the same amount of compacted and if it's very very compact for some reason it will have a harder time actually letting water flow into the soil and then towards the gut underground instead what it will do is run off and when it does that it picks up sediment and erosion and carries it to the reef Because the Virgin Islands are relatively small islands, the connection between land and sea, between ridge to reef, in the Virgin Islands is, is very, very direct and easy to see. But that means that when there's water moving through the watershed, it doesn't have to go very far. We also want to make sure that the quality of that water is healthy before it reaches our coastal zone, our beaches, our shorelines, our seagrass beds, our coral reefs, and our wetlands.
So in the tropics, you have these intense rain events. It often will erode the soil in a watershed and that flows straight into a ravine or a gut. And then that flows down right into the ocean. We already know that it impacts corals pretty severely, but we don't really understand how it affects the fish populations, their reproduction, and just the overall health of the ecosystem. So we picked Reef Bay as our study site because it has a nice natural gradient. On the western site, it's more sediment because it's closer to more development in Fish Bay, whereas the eastern site has less sediment loads because it's well within the national park. They have these two populations of yellowtail parrotfish. One population lives on the eastern reefs and the other one lives on the western reefs. And these two populations go to very separate spawning aggregation sites. Previous research has shown that different sediment loads affect the different types of algae that grow on the reef, which may or may not affect the parrotfish health, which is kind of where my project comes in to see if the parrotfish are more or less healthy based on how much they spawn, which we can tell via the sound they make. I think I want it like directly in the middle of those two because that's where we got the hydromouth sound the last time. That's where it like caught it better. Because when we had it over here, the base, the cyclops on the base over here, it didn't pick it up as much. Okay. Okay. The two different kinds of recording devices I use are a loggerhead cyclops, which is just a big fancy underwater microphone. And then we also use hydromoths, which are smaller. And so we go and we place those down in the water column and we leave them during the fish's spawning period. And we notice that these fish produce a small little clicking or snapping sound at the top of their spawning rush. And so we're able to link the video and the audio. So now we're able to quantify the number of spawning rushes at the two different spawning sites using this technique of the audio and video um, combination. When looking at the audio data differences between the two sites, the western site, which is the more developed site, we saw that there were more spawning rushes, but there were less fish per rush when compared to the eastern site, which had less spawning rushes, but there were more fish in each rush at that site. I definitely think more research is needed to make a definitive claim on differences in sediment load on spawning, but we did find with my thesis is that there were differences in the two sites. Some of this research can feed back into information to help management make better decisions about how we manage the marine resources and also the watersheds, which are intimately connected. Most people know of Salt River as just the bay that you drive past, but it also has a whole watershed associated with it that goes way back into parts of the island that not everybody thinks of as being part of Salt River. But it is part of the watershed, meaning that water would drain through there and eventually reach Salt River Bay. It really checks a lot of boxes as kind of a Goldilocks watershed for us that we could understand a lot about how all our watersheds work if we could understand this watershed. Okay, I'm gonna approach it. Okay, so um, it does have a tendency to get really bio foully, so it's always a little gnarly. And of course you need permits to deal with mangrove plants in this way because they are protected species, so. All right, so there it is. And so these are the sediment deposition cups where the sediments land, essentially. So, just slide it out. That's really the stuff that we're interested in. That's the mineral sediment that comes off of the land and landed in this cup. This 
particular site here in the mangrove is maybe the most important one because it's the closest to the gut. So the gut really is just a few meters upstream, which is that way, into the mangrove. And so if there's going to be transit of sediments and pollutants that go out to the bay and impact the marine ecosystem there, and then the coral reefs beyond that fringe Salt River Bay, this would be the most likely place to detect that uh, flux, that movement of sediment and pollutants. Because it's about where we live. What we can affect change on is the things that come off the islands and reach the water. And the way to affect change on that would be to manage our watersheds and our storm water and our rainfall and our groundwater. And all of those things are tied up in the watershed. I'd love to see these monitoring networks expand and become permanent as part of something that we do in the Virgin Islands. I don't want to see it just kind of be a flash in the pan. I don't want to see it just the interest rise and then go away. I want this to continue to grow beyond my own involvement, something that outlives me. Uh -hoo. Wow. <laughs>